This is a P90. It's compact, lightweight. With a cyclical rate of fire of 900 rounds per minute. From its shape and operation, as well as its place in our pop culture, the FNP90 is one of the most unique SMGs, both in reality and as a popular pick for the weaponry of many first-person shooters. So we've come here to the Royal Armouries in Leeds, joined by Keeper of Arms and Artillery Jonathan Ferguson to take a deep dive into this very 90s PDW, as well as break down what it brings to the world of pop culture, be that in the hands of Bond or as a team of five rush objectives with a P90 apiece. So the P90 is another essential entry into a modern virtual arsenal now, I think. But can you give us a sort of brief history of it in reality? So this is another weapon that originates from a specific military requir requirement. Um, this time it's NATO as an over overarching military organisation and something that some viewers will be familiar with, the Personal Defence Weapon or PDW. Now although this and the HK MP7 are what emerge from that, effort. By PDW, NATO didn't mean a space submachine gun, which is what those two weapons effectively are, um, at least to us in, in video gaming world. That just meant literally any weapon that a military person might carry to defend themselves with. So P90, Project 90, coming from uh, FN Herstal, who, uh, you know, one of the biggest arms companies in the world, uh, not just the SCAR, but, but this. So compact, light, portable, but also the ability to penetrate soft body armour. And that resulted in a pistol class round, if, you can, if, you, if that makes sense, um, the 5.7. Very small diameter, relatively long, very high velocity. And there's a few things about it, the, the round being one that isn't represented in too many games. Escape from Tarkov has some details about um, P90 rounds and 5.7 rounds being better armour penetration. But I think the main thing that the draw into video games is that it's another weapon that, because of its statistics, broadens the class of SMGs or PDWs in video games. Not only is it aesthetically very interesting, but the 50 round magazine, immediate gameplay benefit, but also the, the operation and the, the, the magazine itself is very interesting, it adds more um, aesthetic differences. So can you sort of walk us very briefly through that magazine? I think that's probably one of the most iconic elements of this weapon. Yeah, I mean, you, you can regard that as the heart of the system, really. You know, it, it literally sits in the middle of the, of the design. Uh, the magazine dictates where, you know, where you're feeding from and basically where everything else goes. And in this super compact design, I mean, it's, it's just so short. Superbly compact. I mean, it's not pistol compact. Uh, the MP7, you, you, can, you can make shorter, but yeah, still. It, it's, a, it's a brick, but, but a very slim brick. <laughs> so we have our pull back, lift, and pull out. Now the magazines are a little bit awkward. You need, do need a specialized load carrying solution to, to actually carry these, because that's the drawback. 50 rounds means it's very long, and a, and a quirky reload as well. And the rounds are coming in sideways, as we all know from the various different attempts to animate that and then they're rotated by the follower and they are inserted in front of the breach, or into the breach rather. It's interesting because the, the magazine is so iconic, but games have been very limited to how they can actually animate, because that's the bit players are going to see, they're, they're seeing the weapon from this angle, but a lot of games aren't able to Especially, especially when it start, first started appearing, it was just like a brick. But even modern games now sort of hide it. Like Rainbow Six Siege, they've just put tape over it. I noticed that, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, but it's one of the most iconic things. I think it's always really nice when it's such an interesting weapon that that element specifically is represented and you can see the, the, the rounds being fed. And I feel like a lot of the, the weapons that were coming out around a similar time lent into this sort of spacey, blocky look. I, I, I do wonder if that, if the, if the look of this made it more or less difficult to, to sort of build and design in video games. Like one of its first appearances was in 007 Goldeneye on the N64. Classic. Um, absolutely. Obviously not animating the, the magazine and the reload <laughs> is, I'm back. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, 
It's one of the weapons that even at its virtual infancy, because of its aesthetics and its shape, is completely recognisable. But as I was looking through its life in Bond, I think this, I mean, it looks like a sort of spy weapon anyway, but it owes quite a lot to Bond. Its first appearance in video games being Goldeneye, despite it not appearing in the movie. But then in The World Is Not Enough, in that scene when they're fighting in the nuclear bunker, that's one of its very earliest appearances actually in action, being fired, right. being like in the hands of both the hero and the villain. The, the, the P90, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the elements that immediately catapulted it into fame. It was cemented into Bond very early, both in its bi biggest video game, not its best movie, but in a Bond movie, that's got, that's got to account for something. Since then, it's been, I think, a mainstay in both video games, TV, pop culture, throughout. So with the, with the sci-fi aesthetics, that's, it, it's been sort of tweaked a lot in games. This sort of magazine change here, I think has been replicated in so many virtual firearms now. Just, just the fact that if a gun has this top loading magazine, it's, it's got P90 DNA in it. I think that's unavoidable. Like Black Ops 2 had a, had a gun very similar to this, the PDW-57, and Infinite Warfare had the FHR-40. And sometimes they'll do things like it swivel out or anything like that. But if you're making a space gun and it's got this, it's, you know, it's, it, it's a distant cousin to the P90, right? But in, in reality, we've not really got anything that's close to a version two of this or, or, or the next iteration of the P90. It doesn't really exist yet, right? No, and it, you know, having that very niche origin, uh, all, all driven around that little short, stumpy, pseudo rifle style cartridge, you know, it's like a scaled down rifle cartridge. And the, the way FN went with this, being, being super compact, you know, you've got this, you can compare this grip to the FG42, first pattern FG42, mm. where the similar ID, you want to keep it as short as possible. There are only so many places you can go with it, it's, it's, it's distinctive. You know, it's not, it's also not super modular. You know, it, it's a bullpup already, so you, you can't really do anything with the stock. Um, the only thing you could do with the uh, ergonomics would be make it, to make it more conventional. To put a pistol grip and a stock on this is a retrograde step in terms of what FN were trying to accomplish. So you're not, this, isn't, this is going to remain the P90. Uh, you might see a bit more modularity up front. They, they've already, you know, you already have provision for, we've got a rail here, the tri-rail receiver. Um, there are aftermarket versions of that that are a little bit slicker than the FN version. No one has, has managed to reinvent the P90, I don't think. I don't think, I and mean, this might be even showing my age at this point, but I don't think you can mention the P90 without talking about Stargate SG-1. Of course not. What I didn't realise, let's say first of all, it's a perfect gun for that universe. The near future, trying to tie in sci-fi and reality, it looking a bit like a space gun, suited perfectly. Even though this is, in my mind, the most, very, very tied to that property, it wasn't until the fourth season, like late in the fourth season as well, that it first appeared. And it's one of the few examples where like, the hero characters actually have a line about why they've swapped weapons, because it was originally the MP5 in that show. And there's a few, few scenes in that, in that show where they really like shine a light on the P90. This weapon is called a P90. It carries a 50 round top loading magazine of Teflon coated ordnance with a cyclical rate of fire of 900 rounds per minute. One thing that I found while, while looking into this was that it was, I think one of the stunt coordinators really wanted it because due to its, you know, as just the, the ejecting below, it made it all that easier to get good shots of the heroes shooting because they weren't having to worry about brass flying over their face or the camera being over them, brass flying that way. So that was one of the reasons why the P90 appeared in that show, and also because the show was banging and really popular. No, I, I absolutely loved the uh, the SG-1 depiction. I, I, I remember it first time around because I'm old. It was great because the, the, the MP5 was was the default special operations close quarter battle type weapon at that time. Still early 2000s, they, they were depicted somewhat realistically in their kit. They were a small, self-sufficient special operations unit going off to do their mission. So the MP5 fit nicely with a few accessories on it. And then to, to pivot to this, even in universe, it, it made sense. You know, 
even smaller sort of form factor. Um, the armor penetration thing, I remember the, the line about how this is going to penetrate this alien body armor these guys are wearing, you know, the, the, the pistol bullets aren't doing the job. As, as, a, as a nerd and a gun nerd even then, I, I, I really appreciated that. And, you know, they keep something small and, com and compact like that, but with a high, you know, high firepower without, before you have to change magazines, what could be better? to break contact with um, some you know, scary aliens and get back through your Stargate than that. So it, it made a lot of sense in terms of sci-fi fun, but also in terms of if this were real, what weapon would you want? I think that would be a great candidate, on paper anyway. And I think that you know, elements you mentioned make it so that the P90's legacy in games is never going to go anywhere. It's not being replaced in real life, can't see it ever being replaced in fiction, there's guns that ape its aesthetics and its use, but there's just nothing that I think can, can beat the P90, whether you're doing something sci-fi or where you're rushing a site with four of your mates screaming profanities and trying to clutch out CS go around. It, it's a niche weapon, it'll always be a niche weapon, but it's surprisingly popular. If you look up lists of users of these things, yeah, it's not a standard military weapon, it's not even a standard police weapon, but all sorts of special operations, especially security forces. Yeah, it's the most successful modern submachine gun, I would say. Um, obviously, the MP5 is probably still the most successful, but in terms of the next generation of submachine gun. I was going to say, the only thing to consider is, despite its video game depiction, this is probably one of the most difficult weapons to dual wield but that's something we'll cover in the Akimbo episode.